When the world was still young, Re, the supreme being, created humanity. He took the mud of the Nile, shaped it and formed it and made it into human guise. And he breathed life into each one. And into the ear of each one he whispered the Ren, the secret name of the being. And thus each human was brought to life. And at first, Re, the great, the supreme, the golden, the radiant Re, was content with his creation. They worshipped him, they revered him, they honoured all of the other Netjeru, the gods of the ancient pantheon of Egypt. But when Re had breathed life into humanity, he had breathed into it also the capacity to speak. And when they spoke in praise, in honour of the gods, all was fine. But humanity did not speak only in praise. For humanity very rapidly learnt to pray. They would pray for growth of their crops. They would pray for the fertility of their farm animals. They would pray for many children. They would pray for love. They would pray for work. They would pray for wealth. They would pray for safety in travel. They would pray for restoration of their ailing health. They would pray for one thing after another, after another, after another. And so Rei, along with all of the other gods, was constantly bombarded with request after request after request, until it reached the point where his ears were bleeding with a sheer burden of humanity's never-ending need. And of all of the prayers he received, the ones that troubled him the most were those endless, interminable prayers for justice, that this person had robbed from them, that some other person had murdered a relative, that someone had attacked them, had assaulted them, had lied to them, had cheated upon them, had engaged in one wickedness after another, after another, after another, and people were constantly seeking justice and redress for the iniquities of other human beings. And whilst Ray wearily was willing to attend to the prayers for good health and love and children and fertility and so forth, these requests for justice troubled him, for he had not created humanity to be iniquitous and cruel and vindictive and dishonest. He had created them to be good, devoted creatures. And at length the sheer awfulness of humanity troubled Ray so intensely that he flew into a rage. He roared, he shouted, he thundered, he bellowed the name Sachmet. And as the Ren is said and spoken, so the manifestation of the Ren comes into being. As Sachmet, for the very first time in all of existence, had leapt from the lips of Ray. So she ceased to be sound and became flesh, became form. She landed on four enormous paws, and the great massive lioness roaring and prowling and thundering her way across the world. And as the very embodiment of the rage, the wrath of Ray, this burning sun of a goddess, scorched the earth before her, and scorched humanity before her. She set to predating upon the very wickedest of the human race. She devoured the paedophiles. She devoured the bestialists. She devoured the politicians. She devoured the murderers. She devoured the torturers. One after another, after another, after another, she consumed the wicked ripping and tearing and gulping down their flesh, lapping up their blood, until all of the very, very, very wickedest people in the world were gone. And the prayers for justice were answered. And so Ray ceased to be troubled by them. But, Sahmet had developed a taste for blood. It's very Moorish. 
and having eaten all of the very, very, very wicked people, she felt it beholden upon her to eat the quite wicked people. So she set to to devour the burglars, the robbers, the traders in opiates, the publishers of scandalous newspapers, the bad actors, those whose devilment inflicted misery upon the world, but nowhere near the amount of misery of those she had eaten first off. And so for many months, the lands of Egypt, and indeed the lands beyond Egypt, were filled with the sounds of the crunching of bones, the rending of flesh, the lapping of blood. And when she had rid the world of the quite wicked, still Sechmet had a taste for blood. And so she felt it only right that she should rid the world of the quite annoying as well. So she set to devouring those people who could never park their chariots quite properly, to the people who beat their dogs, to the people who lied to their spouses, to the people who slapped their children too harshly. One after another, after another, after another, she consumed the annoying and the unpleasant. And suddenly Ray found himself being troubled once again by prayers, but this time the prayers were from the surviving sector of humanity, who realised, for we are all a little bit annoying at times, that their number would soon be up. They were prayers for mercy, for clemency, for forgiveness, prayers that he should take Sechmet away from humanity. And he listened with a growing concern, realising that if Sechmet had her way, she would consume everything in sight. There would be no humans left to reverence the Netjeru. And so Ray did what he always did when he needed to speak directly to humanity. He communed with the high priests and the high priestesses of the ancient temples through dreams through visions, through metaphor, and he instructed them on what to do. And in one of the great cities, the city to which Sechmet was gradually approaching in the night, he visited the high priest with a dream. And the high priest, when he awoke in the morning, immediately rushed out and told all of the people, what few of them that were left, what needed to be done. And they were so afraid of what awaited them in the desert that not one complained, but they all immediately rushed to with shovels and with picks. They went outside the city walls, two miles outside the city walls, and there all of the able-bodied dug and dug and dug and dug a huge great trench in the hard, baked, packed earth of the desert. And when this trench was dug, they rushed back to the city, and they loaded up their wagons with barrel after barrel after barrel of beer, and this they brought out to the great trench. And whilst the able-bodied were emptying barrel after barrel after barrel of beer to fill up this trench to create a lake of beer, the less able-bodied were busy gathering red ochre from the desert around them and slowly mixing it into the beer so that by the time they had finished stirring it into the beer rather than a great lake of brown ale it looked like nothing so much as a lake of blood and by this time the day had grown long and evening was approaching and the roaring of the lioness in the desert echoed across the land and people fled straight back into the city walls although they knew full well from past experience that those walls would not hold out the mighty lioness Sechmet herself but they quivered under the bed and they prayed 
that the visions granted to the High Priestess would be true and accurate visions. The bravest of the brave kept watch from the city walls, and they heard the growling and the approach of the lioness through the desert. And then silence as she paused. And then they heard lapping and gulping and slurping as she fell to drinking up what she thought was an enormous lake of blood. She drank and she drank and she drank and she drank until there was not a single drop of beer left in that lake. And at the end of it, she did what any of us would have done after drinking a lake of beer. She passed out in a heap at the bottom of the trench. And as the sun rose in the morning in the east, as Ray returned from Dwight the Underworld and his great royal barge back into the sky above, the people of the city, led by the old high priest, rushed out into the desert and looked into the great trench, expecting to see an unconscious lioness. But what they saw was not the lioness. What they saw lying in the bottom of that deep trench, passed out and snoring, was a creature unlike any ever seen in Egypt before. An enormous, great, four-legged beast. It was a cow. The very first cow to enter Egypt. For Sekhmet in her drunkenness had transformed and changed. The goddess of rage and wrath had become Chetheru, the goddess of love. The great, brown-eyed, placid, gentle cow goddess, bringer of peace and calm and contentment, of love and romance and tenderness. For goddesses are quite unlike mortal women, who, when they drink, tend to turn into lionesses, whereas goddesses turn into gentle cows. And so love came to the land of Egypt. It has been there ever since. And every year, up until the fall of the great empire, the people would gather for the great feast of Sekhmet, and they would drink and drink and drink until the passions of Hetheru overwhelmed their hearts, and they would love those to whom they were near, if they were not near to those whom they loved. Thank you.